Alex, let's go. Thank you very much for organising this tonight. I really appreciate the work you've put in for it, and I welcome the speakers. I see them in the queue. Max, please take it away. Hey, kia ora koutou katoa. Uh, thank you very much to all of you for joining. I know we've all done a lot of Zooms in the last couple of years, maybe enough for a lifetime, so it's very good of you to give up your Wednesday evening to come out um, for this yeah, really exciting discussion hosted by the Fabians on um, the health reforms, what's going on and what should we be fighting for. Um, just we've got some really great speakers tonight, um, but did want to start with um, some unfortunate news, which is that Professor Peter Crampton, unfortunately, at the last uh, minute um, is unable to join us because of um, a, a personal tragedy today. And so um, our thoughts go out to his, to his whanau. Um, but we do have uh, Raywin Stone and Vawari McCree Jensen. I'm really excited to have those. Really excited to have those. The last moment. Because I think, Jude, your, um, your um, microphone might be on. Sorry. So if people could mute themselves, that would be amazing. Um, just to introduce the speakers. Um, Raywin Stone is uh, Pākehā and um, comes to this topic from years of campaigning and advocacy on women's health. Um, Raywin's done uh, really um, important local government work on social, environmental and economic determinants of health in um, Aotearoa New Zealand and the UK, and um, including um, work on health for the first Auckland plan. And she's currently leading uh, maternal health work for the National Council of Women. Um, Rawari Jensen um, hails from Ngati Rokawa, is the clinical director of the National Hauora Coalition, is a GP, is co-founder of a Māori development consultancy and with a strong uh, health presence called Māori Order Associates. He's been chairman of the Te, Ata Ar the Te Atarangi Trust, uh, a Māori language organisation, as well as being chairperson of Te Ohu Rata o Aotearoa, the Māori Medical Practitioners Association, and he's published uh, a Māori medical phrase book, and he's been an advocate and activist, um, and he's a highly respected uh, voice on health equity. I really recommend following him on, on Twitter. So really lucky to have both uh, Raywin and Rawari. Um, in the absence of um, Peter, what um, I'm going to do is just give um, a couple of minutes of introduction drawing on uh, drawing on a recent talk that um, Professor Peter Crampton gave on the health reforms. And I'm just going to send a link to everyone who's interested in following this up to a YouTube link to Professor Crampton's talk. Um, and so just to give um, a little bit of an overview, um, I can't obviously speak for what um, Professor Crampton would have said tonight, um, but in that talk, um, Peter Crampton speaks about the history of um, the New Zealand health system, um, and speaks about uh, the 1938 Social Security Act, the establishment of the welfare state, um, how New Zealand, in his view, was the second public health system to be set up in the Western world after Germany. He talks about the ad hoc development of the New Zealand health system um, since then, and um, in the talk refers to um, major reforms starting in the 80s that have affected health today. Um, and he talks about the, the quasi-market reforms uh, from 1993, led by Simon Upton. Fast forwards uh, to recent years where we've seen a number of reviews from 2018 uh, through to 2019. In particular, um, Peter Crampton in this talk discusses the 2019 Waitangi Tribunal report, which he says um, was really crucial um, at highlighting some of the problems um, in our health service in recent years. And he says that a lot of these reviews highlight the same problems of fragmentation, inequity of outcomes, lack of leadership, inconsistent planning, financial unsustainability. Uh, and these problems have led to uh, the development of this proposed new architecture. Uh, and again, he would be able to speak to this better if he was here tonight. Um, but Peter Crampton in this talk um, gives this overview of how uh, under this new architecture, the 20 district health boards that we have will cease to exist will be amalgamated into Health New Zealand, uh, and there will be the establishment of uh, the Māori Health Authority um, in place uh, by the 1st of July this year. He also talks about the stronger role for a smaller Ministry of Health, a public health agency as part of that, and locality plans um, where primary and community care will happen along with iwi Māori partnership. 
this is a, a big overview and he also offers some reflections in this in this talk which i'd recommend that you all look at i won't um speak to his reflections but hopefully that gives you a little bit of an overview of the reforms i think um perhaps Raywin and Rawari will expand on these. Um, the Pi Order Healthy Futures Bill is currently going through the House, it raises lots of questions about the kind of health system we've had, the system we have at the moment and what we want in the future. And so I'm gonna pass over um, to our two speakers to speak for around 10 minutes, maybe a little longer if they'd like, and then we'll throw it all uh, over to you for questions. So we'll start with Raywin. Thank you so much for speaking. Um, I'd like to focus my contribution on the population strategies, specifically the women's health strategy and the locality plans. And I'd just like to take a look at how they should be developed and how they should work together, what should be in them and the priorities and gaps and outstanding issues. So in the current bill, there are several population strategies, haora Māori, specific people, disabled people. And the purpose of the strategies are to provide a framework to improve health outcomes for those specific groups, assess the current state of their health outcomes and performance of the health system, assess medium and long-term trends that will affect the health and health system performance for those populations, and set up priorities for service and health system improvements, including workforce development. I think here it's really important to emphasize that health is an area where disparities between populations are stark and where intersectionality or cumulative impact of multiple disadvantage and discrimination are most apparent. Wahini Māori, Pacifica women, disabled women have far worse outcomes in most areas of women's health than Pākehā women. I think we're depressingly familiar with statistics such as Wahini Māori have some of the highest rates of breast cancer, cervical and lung cancers in the world, with respectively death rate of 1.5, 2.5, and four times that of non-Māori women. These are shocking statistics and arguably a breach of te, te, te reti obligations. And also we remember, as I'm sure all of us in this audience know, that most of the determinants of health and well-being lie outside the health, uh, health system. As a select committee recognised, recommending an additional clause 7.1.E.V. to provide that quote, the health system should undertake promotional and preventative measures to address wider determinants, including climate change, that adversely affect people's health. This again is recognition that unless we as a country simultaneously address the wider determinants, especially housing, poverty and family violence, these health reforms by themselves will not achieve the desired outcomes. Now, the women's health strategy. The inclusion of the women's health strategy is a cause for celebration, showing what can be achieved by years of persistent campaigning and advocacy by professional organisations like the Royal Australia and New Zealand College of Obs and Gynes, National Council of Women New Zealand, Gender Justice Collective, Women's Health Action, and many, many more groups. In April last year, 2,900 signature petition from advocacy groups was presented to Parliament. So it was hugely disappointing that a women's health strategy wasn't included in the original bill. It was strongly advocated for in submissions, recommended by the Select Committee, and accepted by Associate Minister Verrill um, almost immediately before and before the bill went back to the House. And just a note here on terminology for NCW, Gender Justice Collective and most women's organization, the term women includes trans women and non-binary and intersex people. So just about the development of the strategy, sees that what is fundamental to their success is who's involved and how, adequate resourcing, that they contain clear priorities and pathways, and that they are well integrated with other population strategies, locality plans, and reflected and clearly linked in the government policy statement and New Zealand health plan. All of these aspects are a bit opaque in the current bill. Some necessarily so, as it's important that iwi, hapu, whanau, and specific communities and the non-government sector help design the development of the strategies, that no one template for how they will be developed 
they must work and be developed by each specific population. No specific money as yet has been put in, uh, been identified for developing the strategies. Gender Justice Collective has asked for $6 million in the budget for the women's strategy, and we will wait to see what is in the forthcoming budget. So critically, who and how will be, they, be involved? The Select Committee has recommended, including an obligation that the New Zealand Health Authority consult individuals and organisations outside the health sector, and crucially, those with lived experience. NCW and others would like to see an inquiry approach taken to developing the strategies where those with lived experience can tell of their health needs and experience or not of the current health system and what needs to change. How they involved is it critical. We, now, we know that online surveys, public meetings don't work for marginalized or even busy people. As we already knew and COVID reinforced, you have to work through trusted community leaders and organizations, go to people on their own whenua, on their own terms, fit in with their lives, and according to their tikanga and cultural protocols. It could be, for example, that engagement with wahini Māori is better done under haora Māori strategy rather than the women's health strategy, but then the results of that engagement would inform and drive the women's health strategy. There'll always be a tension between getting on with it, with what we already know, and authentic engagement and readiness to hear different perspectives on needs and solutions. Since last September, the Ministry of Health has begun quarterly reporting on a range of women's health outcomes at the request of Minister Beryl. There's been useful work done, like a stock take of maternal mental health services, maternity service guidelines, and establishing monitoring and evaluation mechanisms for these issues. But the women's health strategy must not be just a collation and expansion of the Ministry of Health work plan. That plan must be guided by a bottom-up strategy. Turning to priorities in the women's health strategy, all the strategies need clear priorities, clear pathways, measures, and timeframes. The major health issues for women related to the unique reproductive roles and the social, economic, and cultural impacts of those are periods, endometriosis, contraception, gynecological cancers, pregnancy and birth injuries, menopause. But within that framework, there's a growing consensus that the most urgent and critical priority is a comprehensive integrated approach to the first thousand days, from conception through pregnancy and childbirth to the first one or two years of a child's life sometimes known as the perinatal period. We now know that during this time, the baby's brain develops more quickly than at any other time in their lives. There's growing and irrefutable evidence, such as the Dunedin Longitudinal Study and work by Sir Peter Gluckman, that the perinatal period are fundamental in shaping a child's lifelong outcomes in health, education, income, and general well-being. The risk of mental illness is particularly high during pregnancy and childbirth, it's estimated that 10 to 20% of birthing parents in Aotearoa, New Zealand, experience significant distress enough to be, meet clinical definitions of mental illness. And this can be hugely detrimental on the mother-infant relationship, on that critically important early attachment and bonding with the child and ability to provide adequate care. This can have social, emotional, behavioral development delays and problems with long-term consequences for the child's development. The Helen Clark Foundation has just released a superb report by Holly Walker, Ahura Tia Tirito, It Takes a Village, how better support for perinatal mental health could transform the future for whānau and communities in Aotearoa, New Zealand. It shows that the disparities are stark. Suicide is the leading cause of death for pregnant women and new mothers in Aotearoa, New Zealand. And more than half of pregnant or new mothers who have died by suicide since 2006 have been wahini Māori. And they're more than three times more likely to die by suicide than Pākehā. This is a critical public policy challenge and the subject of current Productivity Commission inquiry because it's about 
not just the future of those parents and babies, it's about the future of, of our country. And if we are seriously about addressing intergenerational inequality, we must ensure equity, we must ensure excellence in maternal health service for all mothers and pregnant people, especially mental health services. Whereas at present, our, there's very uneven quality and access to um, midwifery and um, antenatal and maternal services throughout the country. There's no universal screening of maternal dis distress and risk factors. There's no universal training for maternity and well child or tamariki workforces on how to respond to parents in distress. Or when, for example, midwives do refer um, mothers or parents to special support, this is very difficult to access and usually only for a very limited period. Other critical issues to address in a thousand day strategy include our continuing high rates of teenage pregnancy, reducing but still second highest in the OECD, unplanned pregnancies, nearly half of all pregnancies for 15 to 19 year olds and a third of for 20 to 24 year old women end in abortion. We have very limited data and research on disabled women, but what we have clearly shows a lack of access to appropriate services, especially for sexual health and reproductive rights. The European birth rates are projected to decline. Maori birth rates are expected to be steady, but with substantial increases for Pacific and Asian births. We need to address those issues and develop appropriate models of care and support. For example, Pacifica women have high rates of maternal obesity, and this is associated with a range of negative outcomes from infertility, complex pregnancies, diabetes, large babies, congenital mal malformations, and worst case, to fetal and neonatal deaths. Turning now to locality plans. Um, these have yet to be defined. That is the task of um, New Zealand Health Authority with um, IMB partnerships. Uh, but I think we can assume that most of these locality plans will be geographically based. Again, one of the key learnings from COVID was that to reach marginalized, disadvantaged and distrusting communities, we need to devolve the mandate, resources and design of delivery to trusted local leaders, organizations and community networks. The select committee strengthened, recommended strengthening the requirement for Health New Zealand to define locality with iwi and local government, to include how those local, locality plans would empower Maori and there would be annual reporting for accountability to communities. I think these are really important recommendations, particularly for ongoing engagement and checking in with communities to sustain their trust. Locality plans are an opportunity to rebuild trust, counter the disinformation that we've seen through COVID, but only if communities believe they listen to and their needs, priorities and solutions become reality in their communities and delivered by workforce reflective of the community. Now, how will the strategies and plans work together? So I said we have a government policy statement, we, we have the New Zealand health plan, we have population strategies, we have locality plans. This is an area where the bill is rather vague. Um, the bill requires locality plans to give effect to the New Zealand health plan, um, right? The select committee recommends that the preferences and priorities and locality plans be taken into account in the New Zealand health plan and there be a level of consistency between strategies not very detailed. There's to be no hierarchy of population strategies, but there's also no requirement in the bill for them to be integrated and consistent. I think it's essential that the strategies inform and reinforce each other. For example, that issues of women's health are not siloed off to the women's health strategy and not addressed in significantly in Haora Maori health strategy. It's important that the issues for rural women or specific Ethnicity, ethnicities identified through locality plans inform population strategies and the New Zealand health plan. I think there's a lot of work to be done in clarifying the linkages and how they will be made. So in conclusion, there's been a huge amount of support and goodwill for the reforms, even excitement at the potential to finally turn the negative statistics around. 
I think the philosophy and the principles are there, some of the structures there. But as Don Matheson said to the Fabians last week, structures don't change things, people do. And yes, we need resources, including a huge transfer to primary and community care. But unless there's genuine engagement, listening and responsiveness, an agency given to those with lived experience and the organizations who serve them, these reforms may be doomed to be yet another in a long line of ineffective health system restructure. Kia ora. Kia ora, Rowan. Uh, thank you so much. And I'm sure we can imagine us all uh, clapping. Um, yeah, thanks for that really detailed and interesting and critical um, perspective. And now I'll pass over to um, Dr. Rawari Jensen. Kia ora tātou. Tēnei paku mihi ki a koutou ko a ko hono nei tēnei pō, hono a i pūrangi ka mihi tēnā koutou. He uri a hau nō Ngāti Raukau e me Ngāti Hinerangi. I'm a GP and I'm from Ngāti Raukau e Ngāti Hinerangi. And so there's a few disclosures at the front end of my 10 minutes. Um, yep, I'm a GP. Uh, yes, I'm on Twitter, at Rawari MJ. You can all follow me on that. That's sweet. I've never heard of the Fabians, and I looked it up. Oh, Max helped me find it. Okay. It's all my left-wing mates, deadly. Uh, it looks like out of the 62 of you on tonight, I know about a quarter of you. Wow. Um, so I'm a treaty claimant. I was part of the Y2575 Kaupapa inquiry into um, uh, the health system and the outcomes. And so I was lead treaty claimant for the Māori Medical Practitioners Association. And I work for the National Hauora Coalition, which was a, a lead treaty claimant, uh, 2687. Um, and I'm now doing some work for the Interim Māori Health Authority. So it's got an eye in the front of it, but it's a little eye, interim. And originally, it was going to be Independent Māori Health Authority. And it's not. So I've just noticed all of those things, and um, then I'll talk non-stop for 10 minutes until Max interrupts me. Um, so I guess part of what I want to talk about is the story of having Māori Health Authority, and I've already located that conversation for you in the treaty claim process. So Y2575 is one of the most important COPAP inquiries we've had, given that we've gone through most of the historical land um, tribal-based claims. There's some hundreds of claims left, and the tribunal looked into it and said, OK, let's group them up by kaupapa, effectively. So the um, health uh, system and outcomes inquiry um, brought together about 180 originally claims. And as I say, the Māori Medical Practitioners Association, we were a claimant in that. And Māori PHOs have been claimants in that. And so the at least part of the provocation for having a Māori Health Authority comes from um, the NHC claim uh, and somewhat supported by other claimants, 1315 and others. Um, adjacent to that, we should notice the Health and Disability Services Review, the Simpson Review, and the two things tried to kind of get a bit of um, aligned momentum. It was important to the tribunal to try and come in with an interim report in a timely way that would help the Simpson review. Um, the review did align in regard to the findings from 2575, the unacceptable Māori health inequities, institutional racism, um, that the existing design and purchasing and contracting approaches have increased inequity, that embedding Māori knowledge systems will need to be part of the future, that additional investments required in kaupapa Māori health services, uh, that the Māori health workforce needs further development. 
and the Simpson Review also made some findings about stewardship and leadership. Uh, the review in the end included two different approaches to um, having a Māori health authority and um, you know, acknowledge that it would have been lovely to have Peter here and, and just, you know, you know, the family tragedy that he's dealing with. So, you know, just thinking of him. He was involved in that um, review and he was one of the ones who was the dissenting opinion. And it was curious because the majority of the people involved in the review were part of the dissenting opinion. And yet the minority opinion was the major part of it. And I guess I'd, I'd reflect back on that and think, um, you know, Heather Simpson's a, a very accomplished um, uh, senior um, bureaucrat inside the, the machinery of government. And at the time, it was a coalition government. It was Labour and the Māori Party. Oh, no, it was, it's like the Christmas tree party. Eh? It was red and silver. So um, the New Zealand First Party was part of it. And it was clear that they there were certain things they weren't going to agree to. So um, the recommendations from the Health and Disability Services Review, I think were tailored to understanding the political environment that existed at that moment. Lo and behold, um, New Zealand First wasn't part of the next government. Um, and so Labour on their own were able to push much further. So the announcement from Cabinet was to have an independent Māori Health Authority last year. Uh, I'm noticing that several times in this talk tonight, but within six weeks of going, yes, independent Māori Health Authority, they had resiled from that and have um, gone back to just having a Māori Health Authority, which is a crown entity. The Māori Health Authority is not the treaty partner in the new set of arrangements. The treaty partner in the new set of arrangements will be Iwi Māori Partnership Boards. And at this stage, we're not certain of the number of them, but um, you know the work is underway now to establish those Iwi Māori Partnership Boards. And that will be important in terms of um, monitoring the performance of the Māori Health Authority. Um, so the interim Māori Health Authority is in play now and there is a kind of lift and shift of existing workforces from the Ministry of Health or uh, to heading a whole water, the health promotion agency or the DHBs or so shifting those workforces into the new structures. And I'm really pleased to hear what uh, Raven said about the Don Matheson comment that structures uh, are not going to change. We need people to change if we want a different outcome in terms of health. And it will be that we do have to give some pretty clear indication, some pretty clear instructions, but we need people to make some very deliberate determined changes in the way that we do the work in the health system. Um, yeah, so we end up with uh, the, the Minister of Health, having a Ministry of Health and a public health agency, which is embedded in it, and then the Māori Health Authority and Health New Zealand. And so then the rest of it becomes a conversation of thinking about how the Māori Health Authority works with those other parties. So there's a role for Māori Health Authority to work with the Ministry of Health in terms of policy. Um, the Ministry will have a focus on strategy and policy and um, stewardship. Uh, the Māori Health Authority will need to work with the Ministry, but also work with the Public Health Agency and clearly have a very close working relationship with the with Health New Zealand it's four regions, and then localities will need to be um, constructed or co-constructed or co-created 
um, in probably up to 70 different localities. And so there's an enormous amount of work and, and Māori Health Authority, you might imagine, will be able to bring additional information to a locality setting. Um, a Iwi Māori Partnership Board might want um, specific further work done in part of the health needs assessment for a given locality. And, you know, so there's a number of ways of thinking about how Māori health is going to be addressed through those entities. Um, the Māori Health Authority will have specific leadership role in terms of commissioning kaupapa Māori um, service programs, uh, a specific responsibility about bringing mā tauranga Māori, Māori knowledge and Māori capability into all of those settings. Um, I guess one of the things I want to kind of uh, elevate in our thinking about it is the, the Y2575 report, which upgraded our previous kind of 3P principles, Treaty of Waitangi, upgraded to five, um, but also said that Māori are entitled to design, deliver, and monitor um, health services. And so that will be a feature going forward that Māori will be involved in designing services, Māori will be involved in delivering services, and Māori will be involved in monitoring. And so to be clear, the Māori Health Authority has a role in monitoring Health New Zealand. Uh, so I guess those are the sort of the key things that I want to um, describe at the front end of thinking about Māori Health Authority. Uh, it does, I think the legislation, you know, it's drafted now, but what we can see in terms of the um, idea of having the government um, you know, performance statement, um, the narrative that we can hear from um, cabinet about equity being um, privileged in our response. We have an opportunity to reform the health system um, less than once every generation. So once every couple of generations and it's important that we, I think now more than ever, um, take the opportunity to um, elevate our attention to being pro-equity, um, to being counter-racist. And the complexity of all of that, I guess, is that we're also going to have an election next year. And um, it would be an interesting fantasy to imagine all of the things that Māori Health Authority would get done in 18 months that meant that whether or not it existed was no longer an electoral um, football. And uh, so I'm interested in the work that I'm doing with the Māori Health Authority to uh, think through what are the opportunities for us to deploy programs which evidence a new approach, to deploy programs which give us early indications of bending a curve, to deploy programs which give us clear evidence of um, better engagement by Māori in the health system, to deploy programs which give us good evidence of improving health outcomes, and I'm a completely unreasonable person. I want to do all of that within that 18 months so that the electoral football might be something else. And I don't want to pick on any other sector, but, you know, it would be, it's a fabulous fantasy to imagine that the Māori Health Authority and Health New Zealand were just doing so many things well that there was no contest. Of course, we have to move forward and, the worst thing that could happen would be if somebody want to rename your Māori Health Authority to the 
how would a Māori authority? Anyway, that's my provocation. Um, Mac said I had to give you all enough time to have a conversation and ask questions. Over. Thank you so much, Tawari. That was, yeah, fantastic. And um, yeah, I think great to elevate that ambition and, um, and great to have all of that background. So thank you so much. Uh, I think it does contribute to a more informed discussion. Um, yeah, so I want to open it up to questions and comments. Um, feel free to put a question in the chat. And yeah, I know there are some people with a lot of experience in the audience. So also, if you have a comment, that's welcome. Just try to keep it relatively short if that's okay. Um, just being aware that we have quite a lot of us. So um, yeah, and if you can put up your hand using the icon, that would be great for, for me to follow that or feel free just to say in the chat you'd like to ask a question. We'll start with um, Aileen's question. Thanks, Aileen, um, which is in the chat. Um, but I would, I think you can read this as well, but I'll just, for, for the benefit of everyone, says, as you said, Dawadi, we need to make the most of our opportunities. So nine or so locality pilots are underway, but what are your thoughts about what should happen and progress in all the other areas or former DHBs where there are not any locality pilots and should we be progressing in infrastructure and where whom should progress this? Dawadi, do you want to take that? Um, yeah, beautiful question, complex. So let's notice the nine locality pilots and the diversity that's in the group of nine. Um, Hauraki as a locality, it makes sense to me in terms of thinking about a geographic location that you can organize health services around the needs of a reasonably defined population. Uh, Whanganui, 63,000 people. That's interesting to me. I've, I've got some of the clinics in the NHC are down there. Um, I think, again, the, the, the size of that one makes it even more interesting. Um, the specific complexity or challenges that are faced by that community. And so the locality's response starts to make good sense in certain places. It makes a little bit less sense. It becomes more yeah, complex when you go Ōtara as a locality. Mm, okay. And so I noticed the the variation across these different localities um, and particular things might emerge that might surprise me about Ōtara and lo and behold, you get certain organisations coming together. You might well have uh, certain parts of the community are organised there that weren't previously influential in the GP hegemony, that weren't previously influential in terms of the the funding flows that um, come from the ministry to the DHB to PHOs, you know, and, and so it, I'm interested to notice what happens in the early stages of developing that. And to the extent that we might see something interesting, I want to know that we can take that learning and provoke similar interesting responses in other communities. The, the, my last comment would be, I also noticed two areas that didn't get the go-ahead to be localities. And one is the far north. Let's think of that as um, Muri Whenua. And then the other one is the far south down in Invercargill. And that's Muri Huku. So we've got, I'm really interested in trying to work with those who have started a conversation about what a locality would be mm. and, you know, haven't been successful yet. But surely if we want to go forward into having localities, it does have to cover from the far north to Bluff, literally. And so I think I've got examples. And it's really interesting to me that we would think about um, those communities. And so we've got this urban and this provincial. We've got all of that complexity. And um, I've only read a couple of the locality plans so far. So we've got to um, try and... Yeah, elevate our attention to the things that are going to be innovative and new and different and challenge us. Because up till now, what we've had is a system which goes GP, um, clinic, uh, hospital, you know, like, and so I, I'm, I'm open to trying to understand what the differences will be over. Awesome. Thank you. And Raywin, did you want to comment on that question at all? Oh, good. Okay. Um, Rawari, there's a, a, another question for you from Robert Beaglehole. Um, 
Cigarette smoking is responsible for two years of the seven year life expectancy gap between Māori and Pākehā. Could the Māori Health Authority make the smoke free 2025 goal a priority? Yeah, kia ora, Robert. Well, we've got to. I think that's one of those things where you go, um, the policy role and responsibility that the ministry has and the need to work together with the Māori Health Authority, and we have to go, this is clearly a priority area. We have to make a change here. Yep. So keen to be involved in that. Awesome. Keep the questions coming um, or feel free to raise your hand. I'll look out for that. Um, I have a couple of questions, so I'll ask one while we wait for another question. Um, I'm no public health expert at all, so but I have a particular interest in um, building a genuinely public service here where um, cost is not a barrier. And so my question to both of you is, um, should we hope for or fight for um, eliminating some of the user pays aspects of the system at the moment. So should we be hoping for or fighting for things like universal dental or removing prescription charges? Um, these parts of the system where cost does seem to be a barrier, I think from the evidence, particularly for Māori and for women. Well, I, I think, as you say, Max, it's, it's, it's clear that, uh, you know, cost is, is a barrier. And I think COVID also showed that part of the the success was, you know, devolving um, the mandate and the service delivery down to communities, but it was free. Yeah. And um, I, I, yeah, I just think that, you know, free universal access to, to GP should just, yeah, should be non-debatable, really. Thanks, Rowan. Laudi? Um, Peter Crampton was a, a witness at the tribunal hearing, Y2575. And he said, and his words were, he says, there's a cash register on the front door of primary care. And um, it's a very provocative um, statement. It is, you know, I, I think we have to understand that is a very significant barrier for people. It's not the only barrier and it's not the only cost barrier the cost of getting to clinics a barrier. The cost of medicines is a barrier. The cost of, oh, you know, look, one, one of the programs that we run is the Money Kids program with um, 35,000 kids in South Auckland. We have a nurse and a whānau support worker, every child, every day. But can you imagine the barrier that it is for somebody to take time off work, to take a kid with, you know, a sore throat to a clinic and then be or, you know, any amount of abuse for not having paid a bill or any amount of a program for having been, you know, late paying, you you know, it's just shocking. And and so the, the cost barriers are very significant. And yes, I agree. It's remove the cost barriers, or, you know, and go further over. Yeah. Thank you. And um, yeah, just... Um, on your point, Ray, when I spent some time in the UK, it was interesting that um, GPs are free in the UK. And um, it's, yeah, uh, coming back, I'm, I'm in an area where it's, it's subsidised and I'm, I'm lucky, but it's still, yeah, you can see how that's a barrier for so many people. Okay, we've got a question from Sue Beachy. Got your hand up. Just going to call on you, Sue. Yes, thanks. Hi. Um, just a quick supporting comment, really, because it really came home to me. Yeah, I'm also English, and when I came out here, I had to learn to take, take my purse and expect pay. I've been here um, more years than I like to think, actually, since 1974, and that's now an automatic thing. You know, I don't really think about it, except when the costs go up. Um, it's just something you have to meet. And then back in the time of the national government, I went with a friend to hospital. She had to have an X-ray. And the first thing we met was a cash register. And the shock of that, to walk in and see that, someone who is <clears throat> in pain going in for some treatment and assessment, having to get out to pay for that before she even got foot, almost in the building, was just shocking. So yes, <laughs> I've sunk back into accepting it and your comments just woke me up. To, of course it should be free and look at how much healthier 
and how much more productive the country would be with good health service. I know it isn't that easy, but you know, thank you. Thanks Sue. Uh, Ray or Audi, did you want to comment on that? Well, just to say, I think also it's it's a national disgrace um, what's happening in, in dental care, particularly um, children in pain um, with, with the lack of access and a lot of, you know, it's, it's some of that, I know there's free dental care uh, for, the, for the kids, but, um, you know, just not the, the, the dentists available. And I, I, I think that um, that is a serious issue to, to be addressed. Um, and, you know, and I think a lot of people, you don't have to be terribly affluent to not, you know, find dental care extremely expensive. It, you know, it should be part of a, you know, um, publicly funded health system. Um, yeah, I agree. Um, Sue's right. It's not that, it's not the only thing we need to do. You could remove the cash register at the front desk and still have a hell of a lot of inequities in our health system. Mm -hmm. So it does require that we do more. I agree with Raylan. We've got to do something about our oral health. It's really, it's one of the oddities of our health system that somehow we treat the whole person except the mouth. You know, like we try and go, yep, it's it's so, psychosocial, biopsychosocial, except for the mouth. You know, like that's deadly. I don't know how we get to that point. It's, it's kind of dumb. Um, We've got to do better than that. Yeah. Awesome. Um, we've got three questions. It's all great questions. I'll, I'll take Karen's one first because it's um, on the same theme, Karen Days. It says, uh, Rawari, would you say that if GPs are considered fully part of the taxpayer-funded health system free at point of care, we would end up reducing the demand on hospitals, would require the redesign of primary care? If so, how do you see a redesigned primary care system? Yeah, no, no question that if we improve the primary and community care system, we will um, we will see lots of benefits in terms of our total health system, and we'll do a better job. That's true. But I, the bit that's I'm reviling against is just going that GPs are primary care; they're not. That our future health system will see much more. Uh, top of scope work from nurses we will see many more nurse practitioners and so there's a kind of there's an ownership that, I mean it goes back a long way Peter Woodard started tonight and talked about 1935 and the health reforms and all that but we have protected this idea that a doctor can own a register of patients that's the cash register is associated with owning a register the value of a general practice is associated with the cash register and the register of patients. That's, and we've got to undo that and go, actually, it, it isn't about you know owning these little businesses that own a register of patients. So I think we've got some work to do over. Um, so we had a question from Tim uh, Tenbensel. He says, I see a big potential big potential tension regarding the relationship between the MHA and HNZ. How much should it be collaborative and how much should the MHA be more arm's length and holding Health New Zealand accountable? Yeah, Tim knows me. Um, I was once described by a, a friend, you know, a critical friend, somebody who was prepared to tell the truth about me at med school, he said, Rawari, you're a rougher grade of sandpaper. Right? So, yep. We, it has to be a robust partnership, one where the Māori Health Authority can say no. You know, like, and just the power of saying no is, let me be clear, it's in one of the early Treaty of Waitangi um, settlements, one, one of the early claims, and the the power of saying no, if you're a tribe and you've got, you know, you can mark it from this point over to this knob and this bay is the power to say no inside that area. Who goes fishing? No, the power to say no, right? So it's, a, it's an act of tino ranga tiratanga to say no. And if we go through these health reforms, you imagine that a locality, a clever locality comes up with a plan and the Māori Health Authority has to be a rougher grade of sandpaper and say, hang on a minute, no, Taihua, wait, you've missed some stuff. We're worried that you haven't got this 
covered adequately. We're worried that you haven't noticed this. And it might well be that the Iwi Māori Partnership Board has signed off on that localities plan. And the Māori Health Authority needs to sit down with the Māori, the independent, um, with the Iwi Māori Partnership Board and say, we've got these concerns. We need to sort some of this stuff out. How many locality plans are going to de novo naturally come up with hepatitis C? Not many. So the contest between Māori Health Authority and the other players, yes, Tim's right, specifically with Health New Zealand, that, that has to be a tension which we have to have a critical, robust relationship in, inside the system. Uh, but, you know, when, when Raywan was talking about um, women's health plans, and I mean, I can hear the same thing coming through. We're going to have to test this on many levels, yeah. So yes, was I think the I think the answer to Tom's question was yes. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question was from Peter Peter Stone to both speakers. Um, how would they see the maternity system being strengthened to achieve the aims of the first one or two thousand days? It's clearly not working at present. Look at the perinatal outcomes. We Raywin, want to have a go at this? Yes. Okay. Well, I think it's the need to really take a sort of holistic, uh, comprehensive first thousand days beyond, in fact, preconception to beyond the first thousand days approach and look at a really integrated system that is looking at uh, maternal health and well-being, you know, preconception, which is everything from sex education, reproductive health education in schools and beyond, um, and including, you know, uh, other parents, fathers, and Fano in that, and really having an integrated system with, with clear roles and uh, getting rid of some of the, the competition. I mean, one area, we, we do have a shortage of midwives, um, and mid, we, we do need more midwives. They need to retain their professional autonomy. Um, they, they do need opportunities to um, specialise in particular areas, but um, I think we perhaps need to revisit the role of GPs um, in, in obstetrics. And my understanding is that no GPs currently um, do deliveries or provide that obstetric care. And yet, when you think about it in, in terms of those women accessing the GPs are maybe dealing with um, risk factors such as obesity or diabetes or other elements that would impact on a pregnancy. So um, I think we just need to look at you know, more integration between the primary community services and, and maternity services, um, as well as addressing workforce issues like the midwifery service, neonatal intensive care nurses and, and, and the like. But I, I just think that we it really just you know, taking just that comprehensive holistic approach at all the factors that impact on a successful pregnancy and, and ongoing well-being of um, child and whanau. Thank you so much. Um, Rawari, did you want to comment on that? Sorry. Look, I agree with almost everything Raymond said. And what I hear is we've got to do a better job of having teams that, you know, provide the relevant care. The, the number one thing that she said that I'll back is we need more midwives. I, I might have misheard. I think she said we need more Māori midwives. That's what we need. And 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 if we don't see action on that, then I think um, Peter's concern, which sits underneath this question, is going to be realised. So I'm I'm really interested in um, supporting immediately at our very first opportunity. Um, growing the pipeline to get more mighty midwives, more midwives in general, obviously. But um, yeah. Great. Um, just kind of on that theme, there's a comment from David Shand um, who says, my concern is who's going to grow and sustain the health workforce we need. We are limited in making progress without that workforce. Um, do you both want to add anything on that point? Well, I think um, in many areas, there is an aging um, workforce. I think in particular specialist areas, I think obstetricians and gynecologists is, is, is one. And, and, and nursing, you know, the, the average age is, is um, you know, quite high. And I, I think we are facing some serious difficulties. And I think, you know, we know there's a bit of a, well, there is a crisis in the aged care sector. 
which is um, not only to do with numbers, but also the huge um, disparities between um, pay rates uh, for those working in the aged care sector and other uh, parts of the health system. So I, I think it's a matter of um, really some, you know, proper workforce planning um, and how that um, ties in with um, our immigration policies um, and training in New Zealand and um, all that thing about pay equity. Um, yeah, and just really because we, we, we are, we already have some serious gaps um, in, in work, workforce and they're going to get worse with um, aging workforces. Yeah, I'll go with that. Um, the New Zealand Health Plan is starting to elevate some signals about more doctors and doctors who sit the NZ recs and stuff like that, which is, that's okay. But if we actually want to transform, transform our health system, it will be by uh, having a, a big pipeline to nursing. You know, like, here's the thing, right? Aotearoa New Zealand, we are the first jurisdiction to achieve demographic of demographic proportionality of entry to med school, demographic proportionality of graduation from med school for the Indigenous population. So in my lifetime, we have seen that happen. It tells you that the inequity of access to health training can be solved, right? It's inequity because it can be solved, obviously, and we've solved it. We, we have a pathway to get Māori into med school and we look after them and we graduate Māori from med school. Well done, good on us, right? Now, having done that, we must now do that for nursing. We must now do that for midwifery. We must now do that for the other health workforces. I, you know, there's a health workforce task, task force going to be announced soon. Um, who was the question from? David, was it? Yep. Definitely worth a comment. Thank you. Over. Great stuff. Um, okay, well, the questions are coming in thick and fast. And just to say, I, I, I'll try and wrap us up by 7.45 at the latest, um, just so you can plan your evenings. Um, but we've got uh, a question from Julie Park. Can both of you comment on how disability services work with these structures? That's a hard one. Um, I thought we're getting a ministry for disabled people. Um, yep, it, it isn't front and center of the stuff that I've been doing. I'll just tell the truth, sorry. Well, I, I think, you know, it's, it's, there's hope that there's a ministry for dis, dis, disabled people, but, um, you know, not clear if that will actually move the dial. I think um, it's great that recognition in the original bill uh, that disabled people did need their own health strategy, that they suffer some of the worst inequities in, in health. Um, but again, we, we don't have a lot of research or data on this. Um, we need more of that. We need more engagement. Um, but, but certainly we know from what data we do have in terms of disabled women, um, particularly in the area of um, sexual and reproductive rights and maternity care have a number of, of barriers and, 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 and disadvantages. So I, I think again, I mean, I, I was talking about engaging with those populations in a way that's going to work for them and um, for disabled people, there, there are particular issues of access in all its forms, you know, physical, cultural you know social um, barriers to that um, but there are some amazing disability um, advocates and organizations and um, I'm hoping that you know that they will take this opportunity to really start um, working with the new health structure to address those those, those inequalities. Thank you Rowan um, and I see Bob Beecher you've got your hand up we'll come to you in a moment but just get Paul's, Paul Chalmers' question first, which is what has been the impact of the capitation system versus the pay-per-visit system? Um, nowhere near as much as we'd hoped. And of course, we don't have one or the other. We have both. We have a capitation model, which the tribunal found doesn't fund 
appropriately um, for the cost of delivering appropriately to Māori patients. And, and we have the mixed model where you can charge um, a patient co-payment on top. And then we'll give a additional complexity to say that if you cap your fees at $19 or whatever it is, then we'll give you some more capitation funding. But all of that put together has not delivered the um, health outcomes to the population that were imagined uh, 20 years ago. Oh. Sorry, Paul. <laughs> Ray, Thanks Ray, for that. Ray, <laughs> Ray, Ray did you want to add anything on that? Okay. Um, then we'll go to you, Bob. With your hand up. Oh, thank you. Uh, first of all, I'm not a member of the Mafia, um, that these are lenses that are compensated for um, a cataract operation two days ago, which went well because I, I know how to, how to access them, I know how to get myself moved up the list. So the, the key word that I'm coming to, to is, outside of all these doctors, nurses and everything, is community. I mean, what we need is that someone in the community has someone to access, someone they trust, who can say, okay, this is what you need to do, this is the support we can get in terms of transport and so on and so forth. So it's actually reaching out to the community, as in many areas of uh, what's working and not working in New Zealand, is that key word community, which I wanted to push there. Thank you. Thanks for that comment, Bob. Yep. Thumbs up from Ravali. Anything to add on that, Raywin? Okay. Great. Um, and yeah, just wanted to note a comment from Gabrielle Brick Kelly, which is disabled advocates have been disappointed they don't have a representative on health and Z. Um, so we'll go to Karen Day's further question on um, health informatics and digital health. She's asking, how does the health informatics digital health workforce fit into the reform over and above giving existing health professionals digital skills? Um, have they been remembered? Uh, not an area I've been doing a lot on, but clearly there's an intention to get some of our digital health infrastructure sorted out. So I imagine that does require the digital health workforce to be part of our, our future. You know, the uh, complexity of having a single health record, which I, I guess we've got a um, nascent version of it because of COVID. But, you know, the idea that, I don't know, like part of my day now is trying to figure out prescribing Paxlovid. So in Auckland, we've got the Metro Auckland, uh, we've got the Māori Regional Coordination Hub. So every Māori COVID case in Auckland will come to our centre, right? And then it will have a triage score on it for risk, high risk, medium risk, low risk. It will have a risk of hospitalisation score added to it. And there'll be two other algorithms that are run against all of those people. And so our team at the Māori Regional Coordination Hub will, anybody who's high risk on any of those risk algorithms will be managed by our team. Phone call, check in, have they got what they need to isolate, you know, a check around their symptoms, um, check around their medical conditions, uh, check to see that we've got them linked up with their health provider. If they haven't got a health provider, we've got uh, four health providers who are prepared to do mobile services out there and, and support Fano. Um, and then one of the algorithms is whether or not it looks like they're eligible for Paxlovid. So the access criteria, um, you've got to have some comorbidities. And to what extent does our health system accurately know whether somebody's got COPD or heart failure or uncontrolled hypertension or diabetes or, you know, there's a list of, there's, there's a chemical list of the things that would make somebody eligible for the medicine. And um, that's the best system in the country. That is the best system. We can't replicate that complex four different algorithms for understanding risk. We can't do that outside of Auckland, you know? So um, isn't that a shame, you know, because most patients, when we ring them up and say, how are you coping with your COVID? 
think that we have access to understand pretty much the totality of their health situation, but we don't have that. We're not close to that. We think we're lucky because we can tell they're vaccinated. We think we're lucky we can tell they've been in hospital recently. So there's a lot of work to do in that area, Karen, and um, yep, important area for us to develop over. So what do you, Raywin? Well, again, not, not my area of um, expertise at all, but it would seem that there's a massive job in, in kind of um, amalgamating um, all the, the data systems from the existing DHBs and what you do to bring that into one, one system. I mean, it just, as a non-techie person, the mind boggles actually. Um, I, I would think the intention was to have one streamlined system, um, but um, having had a little experience with integrating systems from different local authorities with the Auckland amalgamation, it, it is, it's a, a real job. Yeah, and so I think it's a really good point that was made about that aspect of the, you know, of the reforms. Thank you. Um, I have one last question, and um, if anyone else has a final burning question, feel free to put it in the chat. So, yeah, my question is about um, contracting out and commissioning. And um, yeah, I realize, as you mentioned, Laori, there's potential for commissioning Kaupapa Māori services within the Māori Health Authority, which seems to have some real positive potential. But in the current system, um, just from some of the legal work I've done and from talking to other people critical of the health system, it seems like that there is a lot of money going to consultants in the public health system um, through um, primary health organizations, um, through um, contracting out as well. And, um, for example, the contracting out of, of blood tests, I think. Um, it, is that a problem in the current system, kind of too much contracting out and commissioning? Um, it, and will we see less of it in this new system? Yeah, EY's done well out of the health reforms, haven't they? Deloitte's going okay, aren't they? PwC's not at any risk of going under. Um, yeah, so I think we do far too much uh, contracting to... and uh, See, I'm not against the outsourcing. I get it. If you've got somebody, somebody on screen tonight's a deadly as expert on something... And we need that for, you know, three to six months to help us develop, design a new program. Um, actually, we're going to have to evaluate this program as we go. Let's get an evaluator in to do that. I get that. I mean, there's, there's some capacity that we might want to have in terms of um, health service design inside the system. There's some capacity I think we should have in the system around evaluation. There should be some capacity to be able to... Um, you know, deploy and implement, you know, like most of the capacity for all of the predictable things that we do in the health system should be held inside the health system. We've got one national public health system, finally, at last. We used to have 20. Now we've got one. Okay. So the idea that we um, get some bloody expert from even look love love and respect to those who have acknowledged the nhs but you know <laughs> i don't need another expert from the nhs i'm telling you the thing is that we there's something about us being really committed to having a national public health system that i think should call us to resource that appropriately and and bring people to it who are committed to the vision of it and not committed to the next paycheck of it, you know, which, you know, and I've got some of my best friends work for PwC, all right? I'm not hating on them. I'm just saying, I don't think we should organize around requiring their expertise to save us. I think we should be, you know, who was saying it? this is about community and it's got to start at community and we have to be able to listen to community. So we, often we talk about patient voice and shit like that. And I'm interested in saying, what is our Farno listening platform? Because unless we are listening to Farno, we're not going to be starting in the right place. If we're going to have Farno centered health, we've got to listen to Farno, right? 
And then we build the responses around that. And it's unlikely that we're going to build something that suddenly is unnecessary and we throw it away. The things that we're going to build if we listen to community are probably going to be enduring. And so we need to, you know, and somebody in the, in the chat is saying, okay, who's going to be responsible for this workforce? Okay, I'm interested in that because I think the answer must be found within the Ministry of Health, Health New Zealand and the Māori Health Authority that we go, we're going to be responsible for this. We are going to help the tertiary institutes. We're going to help the secondary schools to be delivering us the people that we need to, to populate this health system, which we have imagined into existence. So I'm, I'm, I'm interested in us being the answer and not, I mean, there'd be a little bit that PwC can do, but I, you know, I don't need a lot of them. And EY, thanks very much, but they can pick up now. That would be my view. Raywin, you got a different view? Not at all. I agree with all that, but also I think there's a issue beyond, um, you know, designing, delivering the, the actual structural and system reform, and that's like um, the amount of contracting out there is in service delivery, for example, postnatal, or you know, where uh, the public system just can't do the operations, etc. And I just like to think that one of the outcomes of this reform is is much more uh, will be done within the public health system. Not Thanks, both of you. Thanks both of you for those. There's one final question and we'll make this the last question of the night from Yazdi Kambata Northern. Got your hand up. Um, Yazdi, I'll throw it over to you. Well, I just want to know if there are any improvements or any changes to take place in the dental side and in the mental health. Awesome, thank you, Yasti. Dental and mental health. Raywin and Raori, do you want to have a go at this and also Sorry, give any yeah. closing comments? Just did I hear that, that what was there any any plans for improvement in mental health? And dental. Dental. Uh, yeah, um, I, I think before we said that that's that's not clear um, in in the bill, and we we would certainly hope that that was a, an outcome. In terms of mental health, I think um, it is been clear in the bill, I think it was a select committee recommendation be made clear that um, in health we were referring to people's physical, mental health and, and cultural, cultural health as well. Yeah, taking that holistic view and hope that actually eventuate, there's a lot of rhetoric about holistic views which doesn't always um, eventuate in practice. Any, any psychoanalytical help likely to take place? Could you repeat the question, sorry, Yasti? It might not have come out so clearly. Any psychoanalytical help um, in providing sessions or something of that sort more? Is, is there anything planned in that? So psychoanalytical health, any plans on that front? No, I've got none. Sorry, I'll let you down gently. But when, when you first started your question, Yasti, you said something, it sounded to me like dental, mental. And it made me think there's this... There's a Māori psychiatrist who ran a dental mental program. No, 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 no. I'm just talking about dental and two, two issues I'm talking about, dental and the mental. Okay, two, two I'm loving that. Because dental, dental and been... mental, we should be doing that. We should be looking after all of our um, mental health mm -hmm. clients and going, actually, let's help you with that, but also can we check your dental, you know, like we know you get better outcomes for people when you look after the whole person. And at the moment, we're going, except for your mouth. And so it, it, it's, it's deeply troubling. But regarding psychoanalytics, I can't help you. Sorry, got nothing. All right. Well, there is the whole um, area of the New Zealand's uh, the mental health strategy, which uh, a couple of years ago, I think it was now, the government poured a substantial amount of money in, and doesn't seem yet to be um, delivering as, as expected um, for a number of reasons. Um, but um, just, yes, dear, there, there we do realise that there is, is a dearth in some specialties um, in, in terms of that, you know, psych psychiatric and um, psychoanalytical support, um, which is being addressed um, under that sort of mental health strategy. Thanks. Thanks, Yasti. All right. So just before we closed in, um, Max was hoping to sh shut me down, but oh, too hard. He let me have the platform. Um, uh, I guess I am really interested in us taking pushing the boat out as far as we can people that we really have 
um, significant aspirations for a better health system and that we keep pushing that and we should push it hard. So I appreciate the opportunity to be here tonight. I can see the chat. Look, Janfrey sending me the love and I love you back, Janfrey. Thank you for having me, Fabians. Peace. Awesome, Ravali. Any final comment from you, Rowan? Oh, except that um, I, I'm just hoping that uh, people will keep a close eye on these reforms and get involved in locality planning, population strategies, advocacy in which any way they can, because it is a great opportunity, but it it could all, you know, be yeah, the sort of dismal and effective restructuring that we've had before and um, not survive. Uh, as um, Rowie said, uh, you know, there's a real risk of changing government, uh, particularly around Horo Māori and the Māori Health Authority. So uh, we just need to build the, the, the advocacy, we build, need, need to build the support for, for these reforms, make them better and cement them in. Thanks so much, um, Rowan. And um, yeah, just a, a couple of thanks. Um, so yeah, thanks a lot to Peter Stone, um, who was really helpful in this event tonight, and to Phil Harrington and Brian Numwheat from the Fabians for organizing and letting me chair. Um, yeah, and massive thanks um, to Rowan and Bawadi. Um, I think this has been like both critical and uplifting, and they've had um, you know, shared really deep expertise in particular in women's health and Māori health. And we've also covered a range of other topics from some excellent questions, you know, across workforce, um, cost barriers, disability, and a recurring theme about um, community. And so echoing what Rawi said, um, let's not just um, kind of turn off our computers and leave this for tonight. Let's, um, in, in Rawi's words, it's notice. Um, the gaps and um, the problems. And I think there's some quite well-connected people in this audience. Um, if you know people um, or actually with anyone, um, talk about what stayed with you from tonight, um, take forward this discussion um, and let's build a, a better health system. Um, so thanks a lot for joining and um, have a lovely evening. And thanks again to Rowan and Lauri. Akakite Pongwaria. Akakite.